In his ancestral heartland of Amur, in farthest Siberia, the snow tiger, as the ancients called him, still survives, but only just. A scattered remnant of 50 or 60 pairs now represent a wild species that, within the historical epoch, enjoyed a range which stretched from Manchuria to Lake Baikal. Evolution molded this great tiger to prey upon the huge local races of elk, deer and wild swine, which until quite recently were plentiful in that region of Asia. Now deforestation and development, accompanied by roads, railways and the rifle, have all but sealed his fate. When the Siberian tiger is gone, how, if at all, will he be remembered? We have shared a planet with him, but seem to have learned nothing from his example. His age-proven ability to act as a responsible overlord at the apex of the faunal scale to benefit those he preys upon and to restrain rather than to exploit his awesome powers. Parvenu man has stolen from him his land, his food and most of his lives. We have compounded these crimes by assassinating his character and incorporating him into our language as a symbol of ferocity he does not possess. Cruelty he knows nothing of and a blood first he has never experienced. A paradigm rather than a pariah. The grandeur of his pride, the loftiness of his place, are tempered by a loyal and affectionate nature. To know the tiger is not only to admire him, but to love him also. I bought Howlitz in the spring of 1958, a dilapidated Neo-Palladian mansion in 50 acres of ancient parkland, a perfect setting for my newly acquired wild animals. My own children were brought up with the animals themselves and learned to play with them before they themselves could walk. My little son, Bassa, was placed in the arms of fully grown gorillas at the age of six months. Already, he is recognized as an honorary, if diminutive, member of the gorilla family. My daughter, Jamunda, can still enter the enclosure of the adult gorillas, and the young males extend to her a gentleness in play that they withhold from me. be raised among wild animals is to love them and respect them. From these two ingredients are distilled a reverence for the whole natural world whence we sprang and on which we depend for our existence. The animals at Howlitz have always enjoyed good experiences with Homo sapiens and this has engendered in them a real trust for the whole of our species. I firmly believe that the gulf that divides us from the world of animals is a man-made one. We must seek to narrow it so that we can leap back across it and mix with our kindred again after a lapse of thousands of years. If you lay out friendship and affection on a wild animal laced with respect, it will be returned in good measure. If the animals at Howlitz had any inkling or understanding of the way the human races decimated their relatives in the wild state, their attitude to us might be somewhat different. As it is, they reside with us, convinced of our friendship and respect, and confident that they are part of a family rather than inmates of a jail, or worst of all, exhibits to be gulped at and made fun of. Our culture invites us to despise the masterpieces of nature and to reserve our admiration for ourselves and our own artifacts. The days have long since gone when animals can be kept just to satisfy vulgar or academic curiosity. What is needed is a yus animalium, 
a charter of the rights of beasts, so that all animals, wild and domestic, can have some representation in the legislature and real protection from the law. The wild creatures that howl, it's of refugees or descendants of refugees, safe, we hope, for a few decades from the ravages of the human race. One day we hope the time will come when we can send them back off off to the lands that we have stolen from them and made our own. The odds are not good, the chance is slim. But we must grasp the gamble with both hands and pray for time and justice. Neither of which, of course, appears to be on our side. <laughs> One cannot deny that the chimpanzee has less dignity than the gorilla, but as a braciator or arm walker, he is manifestly more graceful. Though of course smaller than their lordly cousins, they pack the same muscular strength pound for pound, far and away in excess of anything a mere human athlete could muster. Richard, the keeper and I are careful to remove Buster, the patriarch, when we enter their enclosure. Though normally of an equable disposition, he would sooner or later involve us in a hierarchical squabble. Such a fight could only have one ending, as two powerful men could only put up token resistance to a chimp on the warpath. Male chimps are more prone to frenzies than the placid gorilla, and when in the throes of rage or mock rage, the adrenaline really begins to surge in the blood. A chimp berserk is a chimp who can call on the strength of half a dozen weightlifters. And tests with the use of strength machines made in an American primate institute confirm this. Such displays are effective in deterring would-be predators and discouraging the challenges of ambitious young males. The chimpanzee almost appears to concede superiority to man and he is less capable of arousing the awe and wonder that the great gorilla so effortlessly inspires. He is noisy, emotional and clever to boot. He wears his heart on his sleeve and unabashedly imitates us in our presence. So closely related is the chimpanzee to man that the Russians have fertilized a chimp ovum with human sperm, the feat of surviving for five months only. One might have thought then that owing to his close relationship with chimpanzees, man would have extended to them some of the love and care he's lavished on his own kind. Needless to say, the opposite is the case. We use our cousins for medical research into human ailments and even for seatbelt experiments. A grisly irony, as only one chimp survives on the planet for every 100,000 humans. So are the scales weighted in man-made justice. As his numbers dwindle to a mere remnant in the African forest, we scarcely cast a glance in his direction. Other, of course, than to ensure that there are a few more specimens left for the laboratory. <laughs> 